business, they could make a ton of money. They could make more money than him in a year if they were that successful. He never held anybody back. And he grew this very, very fast. One of the things, if you're, who, I know you guys all said where you're from. Who, who here is from a small rural town? I'm from a small rural town in New York. Anyone here from small towns? Who's from small towns? Somebody said small town, right? So small town people have a certain pride, right? Versus the big city people. So I, my, my city that I grew up in is 40,000 people. So it's very small. It's like the size of one block in Jakarta. It's my whole city. So you have a certain pride and a certain, certain dynamic that happens there. Mr. Coughlin was very proud of Kansas City. It's a fairly small place. And so one of the things that he did, he was, he was his other philosophy and, and also in developing people, his other philosophy was he was very generous. So he was always aware of why he was successful. And he felt that the city and the region was a big part of his success. And so he gave them a gift. And, one of, and what he gave them was a professional baseball team. He bought a professional baseball team, built it in Kansas City, and was committed to win a championship, which they did in 1985. And before he died, he gave the team to the city and the state. And that's how, that's how, his, that's how his brain worked. Before he passed away, he, he felt that his success and his wealth had a lot to do with a system in America of supporting entrepreneurship and enabling people to fulfill their dreams. So he was worth about two and a half billion US dollars in the mid 80s. He made him one of the wealthiest people on earth. He's extraordinarily wealthy. And he gave half of his money to a foundation exclusively focused on entrepreneurship exclusively focused on policy, on technology, on education, anything that would preserve and strengthen entrepreneurship in America. And this is the organization that we were creating. So our particular program, the Kaufman Fellows Program, focuses not on entrepreneurship. And we can stop me if you need definitions or anything, but we focus on capital formation. So capital formation is very closely related to entrepreneurship, but it's different. Entrepreneurship is this science, this ability of, of a remarkable individual to get inside a customer's head and figure out a problem, create a solution, build that solution, and build a company off it. But it's really about the customer relationship. Capital formation is what happens in the company building process, a lot of you talk about what does it take to build a, a, a successful company. Well, the capital formation piece is what's all the other stuff, right? Is you need capital, you need somebody to invest in you, and you give them shares, but is that all there is? Is there more to the process than an investor just giving you a check? This is something we've studied for 17 years to try to figure out is there something we can predict that you can do in the capital formation process that will make you more successful? So I'll ask you guys a question. If, if you had to think of the single most important component of a startup success, just pick anything. What do you think it is? Is it the technology? How many people think it's the technology that determines success of a company? Okay, good. Is it the market? What is it then? Just shout out. What? What, what determines the success of a startup? What's that? Spirit. Spirit. Networking. Yeah, you're in the right. It's the people. It's, it's, it's the culture. It's the spirit. It's the people. It's always the people. And so what we've discovered in 17 years of studying this is what do you do? The capital formation process is not about financial capital. It is a little bit at the end of the process, but it's mostly about human capital. But this is, we didn't know this when we started. All we knew was that this, is, this was the assumption in 1993, almost 20 years ago, by the president of the Coffin Foundation, that for entrepreneurs to become very successful, they needed to have healthy capital food chains. Right? Anybody know what a capital food chain is, what we mean by that? So let me explain it. So startup companies, if you look at a lot of them, if you've been around, like I've been invested in 40 some startup companies. Right? You start to see patterns. And the most common pattern you see, and I also have children, I have an 11 year old daughter and a 13 year old daughter. Startup companies look a lot like human beings. Right? They go through conception, 
incubation, they get born, they start to crawl, they start to walk, they start to talk, and, and, and at each stage of their life, they look like people. But what we know about, you guys are all highly educated, is that one of the food chains that's familiar to all of us is the educational chain. Anybody here, you guys are probably able to, anybody have kids yet? Any parents in this room? No, it's not a single one. Okay, so. But, but, so you won't remember what it's like, but when you have, when you're trying to teach a two-year-old, it's a very different process and structure than teaching an eight-year-old, or a 15-year-old, or a 20-year-old, or a 30-year-old, right? The same with healthcare, right? You don't take your grandmother to the same doctor that you take a four-year-old. You have a specialized doctors at every stage. Well, capital formation is the same way, right? At every stage, companies need specialized expertise and specialized forms of capital and specialized structures. So this was the assumption. So, so when you think about entrepreneurship, this was a very entrepreneurial project. This was a complete guess by the Kauffman Foundation. There was no data to support this, but they were guessing that this was something that was important. So this is what, what did the food chain look like? This is the United States. In 1993, our food chain was broken, right? The venture capitalists were struggling. There was no other component, no other kind of funding really available. There was no real process that was understood. There was no way to teach it because nobody was sharing the process. It was very mysterious. And there was no trust. And this goes to the point of spirit, right? The power of the energy, the trust, spirit is, is the glue that makes innovation work. This was, there was, there was a, investing in these capital food chains was very controversial. Okay? So as you guys get into innovation, You'll think strategy, but at the end of the day, what's going to make you successful is how you dialogue, how you talk to your partners, and how you create alignment. And those are the toughest things that you do in innovation, right? Is when you're in a room and you finally decide on what you're going to do is the hardest thing to accomplish. And, and what happens is there's a lot of debate. And this was one of the comments made in the debate at the board level, the Kauffman Foundation, about investing in our program. Why would we do this? Why would we invest in the enemy? The investor is the enemy of the entrepreneur. Is that true? No. Better not be, right? Better not be. And it was this statement, Mickey Slaughter, who I had up there earlier, is still a very close friend of the program. And he said, this really upset him. And he went home at night, he was very upset, he couldn't sleep, and he said, if this is how my board members think, they're the leaders in the whole world. I mean, this is 20 years ago, entrepreneurship was not a common science. People, there was a very small group of people who did this. This is one of the great thinkers of entrepreneurship made this statement. And he said, for that reason, we must do this. Because this, if we don't, this is how people will think. We have to change this thinking. And so that's what they did. So this is what I use. Sorry for the American sports metaphor. Um, I don't know how much baseball is popular in Indonesia, but I, you know, San Francisco, I'm a big Giants fan, but, but a couple of years ago, the Giants who are okay, they're the athletes, they're the entrepreneurs, the guys on the field, the baseball players. They brought in a manager who really changed the spirit of the team. And they went on and they surprised the world by winning the championship. Right? And this is the model, rather than thinking of the capital food chain and the investors in the food chain as the enemy, we'd much rather think of them as the athlete to coach partnership, right? Where the entrepreneurs are the athletes and the venture capitalists are the coach. And so what does that coaching science look like? Right? So this is what we created back in 1995. We launched in 1995. This actually these are these are copied out of my handbook. I was in the first class of the Fellows program in 1995. And so we we talk in the program about how do we teach what capital formation is? How do we develop networks um, that will help investors and entrepreneurships build a company? And how do we develop educational programs and research game and public policy? Because the whole food chain begins with our legislators who determine <coughs> research dollars, who determine tax policy, who determine trade policy. All of these things begin the process and they feed all the way through the system. They feed through lawyers, they feed through 
accountants, they feed them universities. Everything we're doing here, this is all part of the food chain. Right? How we educate people, how we challenge you to think about this process. Right? And for the Kaufman Fellows who go through this program, this is what was hoped for. You would get a two-year opportunity to practice investment and to also do additional education and study. And after two years, you could do whatever you wanted. And the hope was, you know, you, you, you would see, you'd start new companies, you could actually go to work within a large corporation, because there's about 500 corporations that have venture groups. You could work in the government or public private seed fund, join a fund, or go into teaching and research. Any of those things are possible. One of the things that we've discovered in 17 years of looking at this is that if you don't get the people equation right at the beginning of a startup, it will fail. And we think that that failure to get the capital formation process right is the fundamental bottleneck for innovation. The companies that succeed get the human capital right. And I'm happy to talk to you about whatever details you want to hear about that. So let's talk about another word. Um, innovation gets thrown around a lot by a lot of people. And again, it probably has 20 working definitions. We are very particular about how we think about innovation. It's just our definition. Um, this is a scientist in a laboratory doing basic research, coming up with cool ideas. Right? We would not call this innovation. A lot of people would. The number of patents you develop, you're very innovative. We don't agree with that. But we would call it, what we would call it is inventive. Right? There's invention and there's innovation. They sound the same in English, but they're very different. Invention to us is a constant flow of new ideas regardless of market demand, right? It's more about the intellectual curiosity of how does this molecule or how does this material or how does this computer system work? And, it, and it's less about customer needs this tomorrow. What innovation is when that idea becomes a, pro a product or a service that solves a real market pain. Right. In this case, the Bastin is a, is a breakthrough cancer drug. Cancer is, cancer, curing cancer is a fabulous innovation, right? Because it's an incredibly painful problem, right? But you don't conceive, design, manufacture, service a product like this easily. It takes a remarkable organization to do that. Uh, everyone familiar with Genentech? Anyone know, anybody know the company Genentech from San Francisco? Genentech is a startup drug company. It was just acquired by uh, Roche, Swiss, big Swiss giant, for $46 billion. Genentech has created more drugs from scratch to FDA approval, 37, than the next, and then the six, six largest pharmaceutical companies in the world combined. Tiny little company. It's an extraordinary company, extraordinary culture, extraordinary people. Right? We believe that to get to build an empire, you've got to start with a human capital formation that's very, that's very powerful. So this is what we think about: that new organizational success is a function of cultural design, and and that great innovation investors have a particular power to design and coach culture in new organizations, right? I, I'm, I'm an aerospace engineer by training, so I use, a lot of, I use a lot of rocket ship metaphors when I talk to people about building organizations. If you want to build an empire, if you want to build a big company, you are, by definition, building a rocket ship. Because there should be two truths. If you want to build a big company, there's two truths. One is, you're going after a big market, and you're going to win. It can be number one, right? You think of Google or Facebook as really obvious examples. Facebook's a great example of massive market, and they're clearly number one. That's the ultimate rocket ship, okay? That ride from here to here in nine years is intense. It's violent, it's fast, it changes course, there's a lot of enemy fire. So the rocket ship you're riding in 
better be really well built. Right? But it's not a physical thing. It's not built out of materials. It's built out of human culture. So I, I'm going to impress that upon you. This is, this is something that not a lot of people have studied. We're very unique in studying this, but it's something we believe very strongly. This is a quote from a pretty remarkable guy in Silicon Valley, Roger McNamee, um, one of the most successful venture capitalists. And, and the message here, innovation happens at the corners where maps meet. The message here is probably you will not come up with your great idea in your comfort zone. If you're sitting in your area of expertise only, in your hometown with the people you know, you probably won't come up with something really interesting. The way you come up with something really interesting is you cross boundaries. You walk across to a different school in this university where people think and study differently from you. You go to a different region. You go to a different country, whatever it may be. But you find a group of people, say three other people. And what you want to do is you put your map on the table. And they put their map and their map and their map. And the, the interesting ideas are not in the middle of anyone's map. They're at that intersection where the four maps meet. And what are the ideas that you can come up with by crossing those boundaries is where you're very likely to find interesting ideas. So what we do in our organization is we, we specifically and intentionally design diversity and conflict of ideas into our culture. It's something we do on purpose. Because it shakes, it shakes up your thinking. It, 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 when you can resolve conflict of ideas, it's incredibly powerful for innovation. Right? So, do you guys agree with that? If you, do you have friends from other countries where you just haven't been on vacation or visiting, and you, or other students from other parts of the world, and you just talk about things differently, or you just generate different ideas? Has anybody had that experience? Have you? What happened? Yeah, like what was the experience? What happened? Like what, what? It can be something as simple as cooking a dinner, right? Right? You just whip up different stuff because you throw in this, hey, we, we, you know, we use a lot of coconut in Indonesia. Oh, well, we use, you know, we use in America Tabasco sauce or whatever it is. You put it together, oh, that's pretty good. Or maybe it's terrible because a lot of innovative ideas are bad. But these are things that, that we find, right? So here's a really tough trivia question. This is, this is a picture of innovation in Silicon Valley in 1956. Is anybody, any electrical engineers here? Electrical engineer? Okay. This is, what are they doing? What does that look like? What's it look like? Celebration. It's a celebration. It's a celebration that has to do with electrical engineering. Does anybody know what they're celebrating? Can you guess what they're celebrating? What's that? Yeah. It's a big, it's, they're celebrating a prize. They won something. They won the Nobel Prize in Physics for the invention of the transistor. This is that guy right there. A guy named William Shockley from Shockley Labs. This is the startup that invented the transistor, and most of the people around this table became <coughs> extraordinarily famous. Um, whereas the founder of Intel, uh, the founder of Pioneer Perkins, were all in there. But this is the picture of innovation in 1956, right? And it's basically just a bunch of white guys, right? Here's a picture, this is, this is a picture, one of the goals of our program is to create new links, new platforms of investment in the food chain for entrepreneurs. And this is, these are just a, some of the 66 top fellows who have created the programs. Everything from, my, this is my classmate Jason Green, who created the original software as a service venture fund in Silicon Valley about 10 years ago. Um, to uh, Syed and Chef, who created an early stage software fund in the West Bank, the Palestinian territories. Uh, Stefan Helgeson in Stockholm. Daphne Dufresne, who, who created a, a, a large scale bio firm in Washington, D.C. Um, Dan Heath, 
who created a, a venture fund inside the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. Right. Here are some other fellows that do everything. This is Brian Roberts is the top ranked life sciences investor in the world the last three years. He works at a firm called Venrock, which is the venture capital arm of the Rockefeller family. Yes. Yes. What's that? Uh, we invest uh, mainly on the life sciences. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, gosh, he's, he's, I'd have to look at this, he's, he's invested in four or five multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical companies already. Very young guy. Right. Uh, we've got people in public school systems, top firms, uh, policy, uh, guys like Jeff Stein who have um, created a very interesting pharmaceutical company. Uh, anybody here interested in social entrepreneurship? Yeah. So, so Brian Trellstad is the chief investment officer of Acumen Fund, which is arguably the first and leading impact fund in the world. Uh, so this is just some samples of the people in our network. So I talked to you about uh, get some water, please. Uh, I talked to you about this this intentional planning of conflict of ideas and diversity into our organization. Uh, but one of the things that we really believe is that diversity is very dangerous unless you have a high degree of trust in an organization. Here's why. This is a little exercise that we do. Uh, has anyone here done scenario planning? Do you even know what it is? Here's a, here's, this is scenario planning is Scenario planning is you look at a couple of variables into the future, and off of those variables, you can predict outcomes and make a plan for each of those outcomes. So you minimize your level of surprise. A surprise in business is oftentimes a bad thing. So here's a little scenario plan that we use to help people understand the different kinds of situations that can arise in innovation. On one axis, on the y axis, is transparency of information, and on the other is the rate of change. Right. So what quadrant, would, what in the state of the world right now, with transparency of information and rate of change, what quadrant would you guys say we are? Are we here, 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 or here? Who thinks we're, who thinks we're here? Okay. Who thinks we're here? Okay. How about here? How about here? Right. Here's how we think about it. Right? When transparency is high and rate of change is high, you have growth. Right? Is the world in a state of growth right now? Right? Is it, is, you know, is, is China in a state of growth at the moment, right now? What's the confidence level that China's in a state of growth versus five years ago? Is it really in a state of growth? Does everybody believe it's in a state of growth? We're not entirely sure, right? Is Indonesia in a state of growth? Yes. Probably. How about the United States? No. How about Greece? No. Right? So as you go around this, like, and this is, it doesn't, this is how you figure out where you are. When transparency is high and rate of growth is low, it, it's kind of comfortable. Right? Yeah, I would say like maybe like England, UK is kind of like that. Right? The US is eh, it's hard to say where the US is. I, we we might be we might be coming here now. We haven't been there. We were probably here for a while, right? Here's the interesting one. This is where we think the world is heading, to a constant state of transition, right? This feeling that things are changing very quickly. Do you guys all feel like the world is changing quickly? Yes. Does it feel that way? It feels that way to me. I'm older than you guys. Do you feel like you have enough information to understand what's going on? No. No. Right? So, me too. And so that's why this is, this is something we think is very important to understand that probably 
what's going to happen is that, that state of transition is only going to get stronger. Change is going to continue to increase. You've got all these cabinets like the internet and travel and logistics, and, and you've got so much complexity right, that it's only going to change. So what do you do about it? How do you deal with an environment where you never really know what's going on? Do you know what, do you know what that does to the human brain? Do you know what that does to our bodies? What do you think it does to us? Stress. Incredibly stressful, right? And what does stress cause? Yes. Illness, cancer, high blood pressure, alcoholism, right? It's, and, and because people don't have a model for understanding this, the problem with this model is that it's based on very old-fashioned thinking. It's based on factory kinds of thinking, right? Simple factory Newtonian laws, right? Everything's linear. You apply a force to a chair, and you know the chair is going to slide that far, right? It's easy to talk to you guys about this because you're all technology people. So this is something, this is my, the most, probably the book that impacted me the most when I read it about 20 years ago, The Leadership in the New Science. And this is a philosopher and a thought leader in the U.S. named Margaret Wheat. And what she, her thesis of her book was that if you want to understand the dynamic of early stage entrepreneurship and the environment in which we live and work, you cannot use old fashioned metrics. You cannot think like a Newtonian physicist. You need to think in a more of a quantum realm. And it's a wonderful book. I mean, you guys, I mean, how many of you guys have taken physics? Most of you have taken physics. I mean, yeah, the engineers have taken physics, I'm sure, right? So if you, you know, I'll read you this quote because I think it's very interesting. How do you understand a world in which the only material form is that of relationships? And she's talking about the quantum realm. She's talking about you know, subatomic physics here, where there's no sense of an individual that exists independent of its relationships. Yeah. That was the gift of the quantum world here. It was a quote said there are no independent entities anywhere at the quantum level, it's all relationships. That was something that made a lot of sense of how we started to think about organizations, thank you. As well as relationships. Now this is a physical metaphor, but when you think back to the state of transition and the stress, right, how do we how do we get past transition? How do we get information in today's world? Almost always through trusted relationships. The way that you map the world, if you try to use the media or you try to use textbooks to understand the world, it doesn't work that way. Right? But if you have people who can give you data points that you can map, you can gain a lot more comfort. Right? And in innovation, if you guys are really going to go into innovation, if you're really going to start companies, if you're really going to be a venture capitalist or whatever you do, everything you work on has no structure. Everything is new. Right? There's no rules. You make all the rules. That's the good part. The bad part is you have to make all the rules. Right? You have to be that kind of person who wants to do that. And so being in a mindset of being relationship-centric and being able to be being comfortable in a world of transition, and I'm sure a lot of you have this with your parents, right? Your parents don't really quite understand what's this entrepreneurship thing. Are you really going to start a company? You go to this famous school, go get a safe job, right? That's crazy. Well, you know what? I disagree. I think it's actually crazy being in safe jobs because they aren't that safe and they aren't that interesting. So these are the things that I think you need to think about. So, hang on one second. So, this is a snapshot today of our network of fellows. This is where we exist today, okay? And you can see there's a, there's a small problem there, right there, right? There's, there's no star there. We're hoping we're, gonna, we're hoping we're gonna fix that. That's Singapore, that's the best I can do. I think when I put the star there, I kept sliding back up. I know it's, it's not in Malaysia, it's actually right there in Singapore. Uh, but the idea is if you look at these, generally the larger stars represent a higher concentration of fellows. But this is what our network looks like. Right? This is how we, this is how we get an understanding of what's going on in the world. Right? So, 
I take you back to the earlier part of the presentation. When we set out to work on the capital food chain in the United States, right? But what we started with in 1995 wasn't a chain. It was just a single link. And, and remember, this is a complete guess. There's no, there's not a lot of information to start this program. And the guess was we could go in to the venture funds in the United States, which were the only investors that had any track record of success, and maybe they know something. Maybe by getting in there and working with them, we can learn what they did. And that's what we did. And we did that for about six or seven years. And then we started a process where we spun out of the Kauffman Foundation. With funding from the Kauffman Foundation, we became our own separate educational institution, which gave us the freedom to go global because the Kauffman Foundation was restricted to the United States. And so in 2001, we added a fund in China because we thought maybe some entrepreneurs are going to come from China. And this was kind of a guess because it was early in the days of China, but we were pretty sure that something was going to happen there. And then we thought the next year, you know, corporations are playing a bigger role in startups. Intel Capital, uh, the capital, venture capital arm of Intel, is the largest and most active venture fund in the world. So we added them to the network. And then we added a fund from Sweden. And then each year, we started to add platforms of different types of investing in different parts of the world. Until you catch up to where we were last year, and now this is where we, this is where the fellows operate today. And this is important because, again, in that, that concept of transition, which implies very low levels of data transparency, we don't know what's going on. So we're in this stressful state of transition. This is our counter strategy to that. We can go into almost every model of investment in every part of the world and we can get very high quality data. So we can establish trends and understanding of what's happening in innovation in ways that nobody else can. Here are just some statistics. This is what it will look like at this summer when we create our, our 17th class. But it's, it's still a very small program. This is the history of the program over 17 years. Uh, it's a very small program, but we're in 285 funds and we'll be operating in about 45 countries in six months. We spend a lot of our energy developing leadership strategy for how you deal with these transition-like environments, right? these unstructured, crazy, stressful environments. And that's a large part of what we, we do, and it's something that we've developed very carefully over the last 17 years. Again, we push on these two forces, diversity of thinking, diversity of perspective, and developing very, very high levels of brand and trust. So that one email, one phone call to anybody in the world in one hour, you get an answer. And that's how we do it. Got to give people time to wake up sometimes because they're in different time zones. Once they get it. We, by default, these are our, our three most recent classes. Most of the women and most of the underrepresented minorities who come into innovation leadership positions come through our program. And this is something we actively seek out. And the most important thing, 100 plus instantiations. Instantiation is a word that means specific creation of something new. Right? The fellows build things. It's not a theoretical program. These fellows are leaders who are expected to build things. They build new funds. They build new companies. Um, if they, uh, I can talk a little about taking a lot of them build education and societal platforms. We don't really care. All of it's great. And here's some of the stats. It's actually 66 levels now that are creating funds. You can change that. Um, but there's a lot of entrepreneurship and innovation within our program. Right. Here's just some stats. It's the fellows have invested 12 billion US to date around the world. Um, some of you have picked up on this. A lot of new businesses, a lot of revenues, a lot of jobs. Right. This is what the program is. It's a two-year fellowship, but the bulk of your time is spent working full-time in an investment platform. Only seven of those weeks in two years are you in education. The rest of the time, you're working. Uh, we use a lot of structured mentoring, of best practitioners. 
Each of the fellows are required to do original field research. It's not a thesis as much as it's a blueprint for a platform. A lot of the fellows' field research turn into new businesses, into new funds. Um, we do a lot of different events and we're driven by tuition. Uh, this, is a, this is, I think, an important slide of what a fellow looks like. They range in age from 23 to 52. And again, that's another axis of diversity. If you put a bunch of 45-year-olds in a room, you're going to get one perspective. But when you put a 23-year-old and a 52-year-old in the room, they have a very interesting dialogue because they're from two different worlds. Doesn't matter what country they're from, they're from two different worlds. It's very interesting to see. Uh, a lot of MBAs, and that's the size of the class. Might not surprise you based on this presentation, but this is what we look for. Right? We're looking primarily at human components that are very hard to find in a single person. But things like passion, vision, interesting experience, interesting journeys. What have people done? What risks have they taken? Right? Ability to inspire. Uh, again, ability to thrive in ambiguity. Ambiguity is stressful for most people. For some people, it's fun. Right? So we're looking for people who enjoy it. Right? Willingness to grow, you know, to continue to learn and grow and change your behavior, and a very deep sense of gratitude. Um, great leaders tend to have, uh, tend to be very thankful for their existence. Okay. This is what we hope happens, is that with this network and this leadership in place, that entrepreneurs get better selected and developed and, and for those of you who probably don't have much experience with inside a venture fund, the boards of directors and partnerships tend to be very dysfunctional, unhealthy dynamics, and so we hope to fix a lot of that and to create more great companies and create better returns. So this is kind of the slide for politicians you know, creates jobs and wealth creation and tax. And this is what we hope happens, that, that developing this global fabric of leaders will unleash more innovation by improving the human dynamic of the country. That's it. More information, that's our website. So that's what we do. You surprised? Is it different than what you expected? So uh, it's, I like a, it's a furniture business. 
ada uh, distribution point okay. uh, from Lampung uh, to Cirebon. Okay, okay. Because uh, that uh, lot of uh, Cirebon mindset thinks that taking wood from Lampung is very dangerous. Okay, because they in the uh, the Cirebon people uh, not have payment from them. Oh, so it's literally like yeah. so could be could be viable. But my team already uh, running. Yeah. So uh, my team knew that uh, that things is wrong. Yeah. So uh, I my vision is good. Uh, this factory will distribute the wood. Yeah. Which you want. So it will grow uh, the wood and Latin uh, demand very high in the world. Okay. The uh, overall is yeah. That's the. Uh,
like a flip chart or a whiteboard or something? I don't know. <laughs> The biggest mistake, every entrepreneur, the most, the simplest and most common mistake that entrepreneurs make when they raise money is they don't understand their capital needs and they don't understand the investor. You guys got it all right, right? Don't understand the person across the table. And they don't have an understanding of the basic mechanisms of how investment works. So you guys got the, all of the things right. right? It doesn't matter where you're from. Right? Silicon Valley, entrepreneurs make the same mistakes commonly. Europe, Indonesia, I'm sure it's everywhere. Right? And the, there's a reason for that. The reason is that it's very natural to get excited as an entrepreneur about your product and your customer, which is great. That's the energy that creates investor interest. That's the entrepreneurship. The capital formation piece is about aligning human dynamic and creating a structure that allows you to get things done. It's very, very common, thing, right? So, one of the biggest, it's not a mistake, but it's a lack of knowledge that entrepreneurs come from, is if you're coming to talk to me, you don't know my business model. You don't even think about it. How can you partner with me if you don't know how I make money, right? Because how? what are the odds we're gonna create a good partnership? Because the partnership is we both gotta make money, right? I have a business to run. I'm not a charity, I'm not a government agency. I'm a business, I have investors, I have a house, I have kids, you know, I have a mortgage, I have a car, I have all these things I can make a living to, right? So when you talk to the investor, it's very important that you understand what their business is, what their model is, right? And off of that, you can, and there's other questions we can get into, right? So how does a venture fund, does anybody know how a venture fund makes money? It's not that complicated. How do you think a venture fund, how does a venture capitalist make money? Share. 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 What kind of, in what sense? That's right. But how, where do the profits come from? Yeah, percentage ownership of the businesses they invest in, right? How else do they make money? There's one other way to make money. To sell the shares after they, they yeah. grew at some point and then yep. share and uh, sell it. Yeah, you get a percentage of the profits off of your percentage of the company. That's 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 the way you really make money. What's the other revenue stream of a venture fund, you know? It's a management fee. Does everybody know know the management fee is and how that works? You basically get it paid a percentage of the fund size every year, regardless of success. So if you have a $100 million US fund that you're going to invest for 10 years, you get paid 2 million, you get 2% a year typically just to manage it. No matter what you do, you could be terrible. You still get that money and you don't have to pay it back. Right? So these investors, they, the way that they make money is they get paid a management fee that allows them to pay rent and salaries and keep the business running, but they really make their money on the share of the upside of your company selling. Whether you sell your company to, uh, in an M&A transaction to a large corporation or whether you go public. Right. So, why is that important? I mean, why, why do you need why do you need to know that from, why do you need to know what I do as an investor? Why does that matter? Think about the questions, right? Your needs, your mechanism, and my business model. Those are the three things, right? So why might I be a, why might I be a bad investor? Not, not a, not a, that I'm a bad, why might it be a bad fit for you? Even though we're both good people, why might that be a bad fit? What could possibly go wrong? <coughs> Definitely philosophy, right? So what are some of the possible philosophies that an investor can have? Yeah. What do you think some of the philosophies could be? How 
the race of the money. Yeah, it could be. I mean, one of, one of the philosophies is how are we going to work together? What are my expectations? Right. Are you going to spend a lot of time with me before the investment is made? Do you think? Yes. Yeah? Why? You need trust. You need trust. It's risky, right? Are we going to spend a lot of time together after I make the investment? What do you think? In, in, in the U.S. model of venture capital, we're going to spend a lot of time together for a long time. We're going to be together for five, six, seven, eight years. We're probably going to have a board meeting every month. Right? And we're probably going to talk every week, at least for the first few years. There's going to be a lot of togetherness. Right? So one of the things that you'll see, um, oh, thank you, you'll see venture capitalists do with their potential investees is socialize with them, playing golf with them, eating dinner with them, meeting their family. Is that weird? Thank you.
you can ask for extensions. It's not uncommon for this to even go longer. 10, 12, 14 years is not uncommon, but it's a long, it's a long relationship, all right? So the way to think about this typically in the 10 year is you have This is really just like farming, okay? You have a period of investment where you're planting seeds and you have a period of harvest. How long do you think the investment period typically is? Any guesses? Sort of the period in which you have to put the money to work. How long do you think? Within this 10 year period, what percentage of that do you think is allocated to the investment period? Yeah, right. It's, it's, it varies. Uh, it's negotiated case by case, but it's typically three to five years, right? And then the balance, five to seven years of harvesting. Okay. So you're negotiating this, and you're working with your LPs, and what happens is you don't get all this money up front. You call it every few months because you do investments, you call it down and you return it. You don't want to hold capital, right? Because you're being you're being evaluated on your your IRR. Because, okay. You guys all familiar with the concept of IRR? It's got internal rate of return, right? What are we shooting for here in this? What, what, what's my goal in this fund? What's my target IRR? Do you think? How, do I, how, does the, how does the LP evaluate me, my IRR? Is it is 15% average good? Is 25, what's good? How do they think about it? How would you think about it? Higher than what? Banking advice. It's the right concept, right? Because what, what kind of investment, how would, where do you think they, they put, how do they evaluate this kind of investment? There, so, you, so the, Let's back up a little bit and talk about the LP. Who do you think these LPs typically are in the US? Any idea? Entrepreneurs. What's that? Entrepreneurs. Well, they can be. The bigger ones are pension funds and university endowments. The universities in America, like Harvard, has $40 billion in cash and they're very rich entities. So it's mostly pension funds, right? People who run pension funds are very conservative. Okay. Where do you think venture capital, where do you think they put venture capital on the risk curve of all the things they look at? How risky do you think they view? They've given me this money to do early stage venture capital in Indonesia. Is that considered by them risky or not so risky? It's very risky, right? So what is their, what's their return expectation on what we do? Should be good. How do they measure it? It's not. It's you got the right idea. It's not. It's not higher than bank rates. It's typically higher than the S and P or one of the stock market indicators. So yeah, if you look at you know if you look at the S and P, it's typically the one that they look at, right? The way they think about it is S and P plus something, probably five to ten percentage points. Right? So if the S&P, when I over the 10 years, if the S&P returns 10%, I need to return 15 to 20%, or they're not going to continue to invest. Okay? So that's how people are thinking about it. Right? So I've made, I've made this investment. Okay? They've made this investment in me. I have an investment period. Okay? And I have a harvest period. Okay, so now let's come back. Now you're coming to meet with me. right? Here are some other questions that we want to think about. Right? What, what are some questions you could ask about this? Okay? Here's my, I get the 2% annual management fee, 20% carried interest. Okay? So here's a little math quiz for you. Of a $100 million fund, how much do I have to invest? How much of this am I actually going to invest in companies out of $100 million? This is 2% per year. So how much do I have?
How much of the hundred million is left after management fees to invest? Don't think about it too hard. It's not that hard. It's good to get back. How much do I have left? How much do I have? Well, no, I'm, 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 I'm charging them 2% per year out of this, charging 2% of 100 million every year for 10 years, just to run the firm, okay? 80, right? Somebody get two million, somebody get two million times 10. That's my fee, I have $80 million left. Okay, so you're gonna come, I've got $80 million to invest. What's the first question you're gonna ask me? What's the first thing you want to know about my fund? Right? It's really simple, really logical. Right? It's one of the things you would ask yourself if you're going to do this. If I'm, think about it this way. If I'm going to have a board meeting with you every week, and we're going to talk and meet and have every month, and talk and meet every week, what, what's one of the operational questions you have to ask about this fund? Right? These are very intensive relationships, right? So what's one of the things that you want to know? Right? Very simple, basic, basic, basic question, right? How many companies can I do in that fund? How many investments can I make? How many do you think? What's the typical in a fund of this size? How many people might manage a fund this big? What do you think the typical size of the team is? Take a guess. 10. 10. Could be 10. How many partners? How many partners are actually working on boards? 10 is probably the right size of the team. How many partners are actually managing deals? Probably three or four. Okay. Right? And how many companies can one partner do? Right? What do you think the what do you think the LPs expect? Because they get uncomfortable at a certain number. Too many. What do you think the limit is, typically? Five. It's around five. It's around five, probably five per partner. Right? So now we have 80 million. Right? We've got 80 million to invest. We've got three partners times five deals. Right? So we've got 80 million over, over 15, right? So it, it, this is not uncommon. It could be 20, it could be 12, it's, it varies. You're not, you're not required by your LPs to say, today we're gonna invest 15 and then actually invest in 15, because you don't know, but something like that. So this gives us roughly 5 million per company, okay? right? So there's one basic question. Right? We talked about what are our needs. We talked about what's my model. Right? One of the biggest mistakes that entrepreneurs can make is they go into a fund where their needs don't meet the model. If you need, if you only need a million dollars, all you ever think you need is a million dollars for your company, are we going to even look at your deal? Are we even going to consider it? No. Why not? It's too small. Why is it too small? Why don't I just do five one million dollar deals? Because they're smaller. Is that because one million dollar a one million dollar investment easier than a five million dollar investment? Do you think? No, I mean uh, it would depend on uh, well, what kind of the, the investment that this person will make. Right? Yeah. In my definition. So uh, maybe in, in my opinion, uh, I have that kind of these situations, and there 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 is one. One industry with one million, one million thousand. I think uh, it's uh, what it's uh, what I try to think is: is it worth it or not? If uh, if one million is worth it, I think I mean I invest one million in you uh, in one or two years. I I got a BEP. I think it's okay. I invest you, but uh, if you you ask one million to me and it takes longer time, I think uh, yeah. it's not worth it. It, 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 yeah, I think that's right. I think that the, the, the experience anybody will tell you is that the size of the investment doesn't really matter. 
uh, a small investment is not easier, and sometimes it's harder than a large investment, right? So, so on the flip side of that, why not just do four investments? Why not just do four investments times 20? Why wouldn't I do that in the venture fund? What's, what's the concern there? The risk level. Yeah, what happens to risk with four companies? Right. Not enough diversification, right? So the general rule of thumb is you need about 10 to 12 companies at a minimum to make sure you have enough diversification, okay? What is my, if you look at successful venture funds, right? If you look at successful venture funds in history, and you look at, let's say they have 15 companies, all right? 15 companies in the portfolio, very successful. What does the profile of that whole portfolio look like? Right? Is the wealth created in a lot of companies? Are, are half of the companies successful? Typically, more, less, we just think, do you know? What's a typical profile of a venture fund? How many, how many typically, even in a successful fund, do you think the majority of companies make money or lose money? Probably. Probably, probably lose money, right? How much, how much money, so, so, you guys know Kleiner Perkins and Sequoia, have you heard of those two venture funds? Have you heard of them? Kleiner Perkins and Sequoia, have you heard of them? They're the two funds that invested in Google, okay? So, how much money they invested 12.5 million in Google. How much money did they return? Do you know? Hmm. They they made okay. So I have to calculate this in my head. Um, they made. I have to get all the zeros right. It was a very even number. It was um, it was like twenty five hundred dollars. This is to Kleiner Perkins. Twelve and a half, twelve and a half million returned ten billion dollars. Just one investment. Return ten billion dollars. Right? This is what LPs look for. LPs expect one or two companies in a portfolio to make the whole fund. One or two companies is going to be an absolute. Number. That's what everybody's looking to do. Right. So if you know that, what are some other questions that you want to know about me? Right. One of the things is you know, I need to believe your idea is a really big idea. And I need to know that it's a pretty timely idea, that it's likely to happen soon. And I need to know that the customer is going to buy from you. But it needs to be a very big idea. So when you talk to people, you need to make it very clear those three things. And if you can't do that, you tend not to have a very, a, you won't have much success in getting traction with the, with the uh, firm. So we know we have 15 companies, right? We have 80 million to invest. What's another question you might ask me about that you need to know about me, right? Think about the investment period. Does it matter? Does it matter where I am in the investment period? Does it make a difference where I am? I mean, if you catch me in year four of my investment period, what does this fund look like, probably? How many investments might it have made by year four? Right? If we're going to 
going to shoot for 15, how many might I have made? Maybe 10, right? Maybe, maybe 10, 12. There's not much room left in the fund. There's not a lot of capital left in this fund. That's one issue. What's the other issue? What's the other really important issue if you catch me late in the investment period? There's no money left. There's no money left. And what else has happened, right? Is there, how much time, if, you, if I invest in year four or year five, look at the harvest period, right? If you catch me in year one, right? I begin harvesting right away in the harvest period, right? This is, this is theoretical. Really, the harvest period is as soon as you make an investment, right? But if I invest, if invest early on, we have nine, 10 years to develop this company. If we invest in year five, we have five. Is that going to change my behavior as an investor? What might happen? How might I behave towards you? Could be more carefully. How, how might I behave? What's, what's, I mean, if you've got half the time to get something done, does that change your behavior? What does it do? Crush, more pressure, right? What, how do people, this is, again, remember, we're, we built this company. I've invested in you guys. We've built this culture together. There's no, there's no rules here, right? We're making all of the rules, right? If we put ourselves under additional pressure, right? We already know that we're in this crazy, ambiguous situation. There's tons of stress already, right? Innovation's really hard. There's a ton of competition, right? And now we're going to put additional pressure on ourselves by cutting the harvest period in half. What happens? What do people do? How do they perform? How good are their decisions in those kinds of environments where there's additional pressure? Do we make better decisions? Typically not, right? Typically not, right? You'll see more stupid decisions made, bad decisions made under pressure, right? So I wouldn't recommend that you not take money if someone's late in the harvest period, but you need to understand that you opted into this environment where the pressure isn't as great. Think of a situation, this is really, this is like a chess game. If you don't, if you don't think about it this way, you'll really struggle because it'll be very mysterious to you. But let's think about a situation where, let's say you take investment late in the investment period. There should be additional pressure, but there isn't. Why might there not be pressure? Because the investors can already harvest some of the product. What if you had, what if you had Google early in the deal, right? What if you exited Google? There's, if the firm, if the firm is strong, if previous funds have been strong, if the current fund is had some good exits, right? The, the, we we think of the fund return, or what we call the deals you're trying to do, or the deals the fund return, a deal that makes at least a hundred million dollars, because then you've given your investors their money back. There's something very, it's a psychological hurdle, but it's also the hurdle at which you start the profit share, right? So it's not uncommon really good firms, they might have one or two fund, one or two investments that by the time they invest in you, they've already returned the fund. And in that case, they're very relaxed because it's easier to negotiate extensions. They don't worry about it as much. You need to ask these questions. You need to know who you're sitting across the table from, right? If you get a fund that's struggling, that's late in their harvest period, right? And they, they, they aren't, they don't have strong trust in their LPs because they haven't you're likely to have an environment on the board where there's a lot of pressure, maybe bad decisions get made. You might feel you're building the next Facebook, and it could be a $100 billion IPO, but they want you to sell five years early for half a billion dollars. Half a billion dollars is great, that's a nice outcome, but you're leaving, you're leaving $99 billion on the table, which you don't want to do because the odds that you're going to build a Facebook twice in your life are very low. 
So you want to give yourself a chance in this formation process to be as successful as you possibly can, right? It, it's hard enough. You don't want to create additional, additional failure. So these are the things to your question. This is what I always advise people to do, is to understand. So when you come and sit down with me, if you start asking me questions about, tell me about your fund, how big is your I would go and I would do my homework. I see that you've done this company, this company, because all the funds have their portfolios online. You can go in and look at the companies they've invested in. You can look at what the companies do. Why did you invest in this? Why did you invest in this? Where are you in the fund cycle? What are your fundraising plans? Right? If a fund says, well, we're going to put off fundraising for a while for our next fund, like, we're going to wait, that's usually a sign that they aren't doing very well. Right? Because if you're doing really well, you don't have to fundraise. Your LPs come to you and say, when is the next fund? Because we want to put more money in if you're really good. Right? So Sequoia or Kleiner, these top funds benchmark, they'll typically, they could raise 20 times what they need. If they raise a $400 million fund, they'll have $8 billion in interest, right? And then everyone else has to work very hard, so you need to figure out where they are, right? So that's, this is, I think, where it begins. Whatever your business is, I would start here. The next question comes back, and you made the question of your needs, right? So what are your, you know, what are your needs? Do you know how to figure that out? But how do you know that? Um, it's just uh, still my assumption. And yeah. Uh, from the input, the uh, cost of uh, the input, the mm -hmm. data, the cost of expedition and logistic cost uh, for shipping, yeah. and uh, some kind of cost of the decision. Well, if you, if you sit down with a venture capitalist and you lay out a sense of what your needs are, what do you think the chances are they're going to agree with you? I think it's still about 50%. It's, it's, most venture capitalists is probably zero. They're probably, going to, they're probably going to have a very, very different view of your business. They may come in and they may actually have a different view of what you want to do with management. Right? So, Anyway, this this sort of answers it. Um, you know, how should we how are we have time? Is what else should we try to cover um, during this session? Okay. So you want to continue on this? Okay. What else? What else can we? What else can we talk about? Yeah. Maybe if, if I will summarize this. Uh, if you want to, if, if we get some capital, uh, if we get, uh, yeah, uh, put it one point five million, yes. Uh, yeah, first we need to know how much we need. Yes, uh, he said one point five is enough, so we less than more, right? Then uh, we uh, we have to find the venture capital. Uh, we need to find the LP or something. Not the LP, then you want to find the. Direct. The GP is the direct one. Mm -hmm. You want to find that person. Yeah. Uh, and in this case, GP is more like a university or maybe a pension fund. There, the LP will typically be a pension fund or LP. The GP will be a fund. And the GP, you know, if you look in, in uh, some of the funds like Indonesia, they may also be uh, families, wealthy families. But you need to find the, the, the general partner who handles direct investment and you need to understand as much about their model as possible. So we need to find this person and we can take the game and put the so then we will get more funds from him uh, from whoever it is. Yeah. yeah. And the rest is yeah. Right. And, and I don't know, one of the things you can do for these programs, do you have venture, do you have a local venture capitalist in Chicago or others coming and speak to the students at all? Yeah. 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 So I think as you, if you have a, if it's interesting to you, you have to speak and come in. You know, we'll try to get to know them and stay in touch with them because it's a process that takes a while to learn how to do. They're difficult, very difficult to connect with. They're very busy, and you know, there's you know, there's typically hundreds of people reaching them every day. It's very hard to stand out. Yeah, that's that's our only difference. 
maybe you have not many things. So it, 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 it's the same everywhere. It's not, it's not unique to Indonesia. It's the same everywhere. It's very, very hard to get their attention. And so it takes, it takes probably, it, it, it begins with a clarity of your thinking, those questions of why are you going to be big, right? Why is that going to happen now? Why would customers buy from you, right? So if it is big, it's a big market, and it's happening now, I'm really interested, right? Now i got to figure out as an investor, who's going to win? So why are you going to win? And that, and that becomes, and so you have to be very clear. What was a, what do you guys use in Endeavor? A match? You light a match and you talk until the match burns down? You know, think about that. You light a match and it burns down in about 30 seconds. Can you answer those three questions in 30 seconds? Right? Right? And every time you see them and you get a little bit of an angle and they say, okay, that's kind of interesting. Can I follow up with you? You know, can I buy a cup of coffee? And, and, and you, you have to be very careful how you reach out to them. Right? Because there's a fine balance. If you do too much, you become bothersome and unpleasant and they don't like you. But if you don't do enough, they don't think you're aggressive. You know, if you're going to win in a big market, you've got to be very aggressive. So you have to be creative about how you reach out to them. You have to get to know them. Some people are very open to outreach. Some people aren't. And so this is why it's so important to get to know who they are. Right? You need to know the individuals. And every single one of them are very different. So don't assume that they're the same people. But that's what you have to do. And, and sometimes it's starting very small. It's finding an uncle or a friend or someone local to put a little bit of money in. But that's something that in larger investors pay attention to. Right? And you do something good with that and you get some, some success, even a small success, and you continue to talk to them. Right? And, you, and it takes a while. It can take two or three years to get them there. Because they don't invest in very many people. Right? And they're investing to do this. They aren't they, they can like you and in a sense care about your business, but their job is not to care about your business. Their job is to find 15 amazing companies and maybe have one or two of them become Google. That's all they care about. And they're talking to thousands and thousands of people. So the ability to get their attention is a real challenge. Right? So you have to enjoy it. Right? You have to be very creative. It's a full-time job. If you're an entrepreneur, you're fundraising every minute of every day. Can't stress that enough. And it's no different here than it is anywhere else in the world. Um, I have a bit of a question. You know about uh, Yeah, I have yeah, heard of it, the television show. Is it our job? Is it say like the the like Dragon So you must convince the investor to yeah, so, so is your question how realistic is that yeah. show? The, the Dragon's Den, there's also, what's the other one called? Um, Shark Tank. Shark Tank. Shark Tank. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, I think it's like any other reality show, that there's an element of it that's true, and there's an element of it that's very Hollywood, right? Um, I think that what's very good about those shows is I watch them and I'm very impressed at the entrepreneur's pitch. You know, they have to do it really fast. And I'm really impressed by that. And I think there's a lot to learn from that. But I think you have to be very careful not to feel like that's a very good thing to develop. And you should practice it. And, and literally this concept of an elevator pitch. You know, can you pitch it in 10 floors before a match burns down? It's very important to do. But I would say that I would think about it. This is this is how I think about it. There's there's sort of three stages of the pitch, right? Right. There's some kind of an email, a simple message, right? And attached to that is maybe a two-page summary. Right? One page, two page summary. And it goes to these questions of, right? What's the problem you're solving? What's the solution you're designing? Right? Why is the market there now? 
here's our organization, we know all this stuff, every customer is going to love us, we're going to get 50% market share. Right? The assumption in a new market is 50%. Number two player, 20%. Number three player, typically 10%. Right? That's old McKinsey data, it's pretty true. Right? 10 times more valuable to get 50% versus 20%. Doesn't feel like it, but that's the way values play out because market leaders are far more valuable, right? So in those two pages, you have to capture their imagination. You have to believe that you're gonna be the one, right? And if you do it really well, you get a meeting, right? Would highly recommend never send this without an introduction from somebody who knows the investor, right? So the next thing you get to do it's a PowerPoint, right? Which is typically about, I would suggest, 12 slides. I wouldn't do more than 12. If you can't, you're gonna tell them exactly the same story in a little more detail. You have to capture their imagination. Well, that you've probably got, you've probably got an hour. So that we did, but must say like that. Yep. But you, you and this one is very important because when you go in, right, one of the things you have to ask is who's going to be in the room? And one of the things you'll find in any, if you get an investment through a venture fund, it's not one person, it's a committee of partners, right? And it won't surprise you that each of the partners is very different. They have very different skill sets, they have very different levels of interest. And you know, you'll, you'll, have, a, you'll have a technologist. You'll have a market person, you'll have a people person, and they're going to, they're based on your PowerPoint, they're going to ask you different types of questions. So you need to know who's in the room, right? And, and you can go through that in an hour. Okay? And that's really important. You'll, you may do that a few times, but the real, the deal is closed every time in Q&A, right? Every time, this is how you close a deal. Okay, I've seen your summary, I've now seen your pitch, now I'm going to test you. What about this? What about the technology? What about the market? What about the competition? I'm just going to keep throwing questions at you, right? You can never fail to have a good answer, right? You can, you can be fine, but your attitude has to be, I have to guess, I have to anticipate every question they could possibly ask me, right? About my company. And as soon as you can't answer three or four of them, you're probably, I've concluded, you're not the person who's going to win, so I'm going to move to the next person. But thank you very much. Right? So that's, that's why these things are really important. One of the things I recommend is anticipate every question and have a slide. Very thin presentation and very few right? So one of my, you know, one of my favorite jokes that I tell people, but it's true, is the difference between when I ask you a question, I'm the investor, you're the entrepreneur. Do you know what? It, I ask you a question, and you say, "Oh, that's a good question." Do you know why that's a good question? Because you thought about it and you have an answer, right? But if I ask you a question and you say, "Oh, that's a great question," do you know why it's a great question? because you thought about it and you have a slide, right? And then you can pull up a slide and go, oh, here's my slide. And the more you can do that, right? this goes back, it's what we've been talking about. What, so the difference between Shark, the Shark Tank and these other shows is that what it doesn't show is that this is a dialogue that's gonna go on for, depending on, if you're a young student, unproven, it's a six month dialogue. It's 10 meetings, right? And it's one pitch after the other. So you get to do your PowerPoint to me, right? And my, my style as an investor has always been management focused. That's my, and I'll, I, I may not get off the team. There may be a whole slide about marketing technology. Second slide is about the team. I could spend an hour talking about the team. What about this? Why'd you do this? Why'd you do that? And, and that's what I need to hear. If I like it, and then I get a little bit about the technology and the market. Wow, this, I like this team. This is kind of interesting. Okay, now, next week, or in two weeks, come in and meet my partner, Mary. Mary is a technology guru, right? So she'll skip the team slide. 
you'll get to the technology slides, and it's questions, 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 and you're pulling up slides, right? Okay. Then it goes on, and you feel good, and then we forget about you because some company is in terrible shape or some disaster. You're talking to all your friends going, I, they're not answering my calls, I don't know what's going on. This is very typical. And then finally get a hold of me, oh yeah, 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 we want to talk to you. Okay, my marketing person, my marketing partner wants to. So you come in, you do the pitch again. And now all the focus is on the marketing. Right? And so that goes on. And then we'll say, okay, now we want, we want to go with you and we want to go see one of your customers. So you'll take us on a trip and we'll go see one of your customers. And we'll ask your customers a bunch of questions, just Q&A constantly, right? This will go on, and then you may come back in with the whole team and be part of our team. And then the whole team meet another part of the team. And then the whole team and come in. And the reason that we do this for six months is because we want to get to know you, right? Do we trust you? We want to put you in a lot of different situations and a lot of different kinds of questions to see how you react. We want to know you as well as possible. We don't want any surprises after the board, after the investment, because we're going to be working together for eight years, right? So you have to really respect the culture of the investment firm and all of those dynamics. That they only have you 15 chances to get a Google out of thousands and thousands and thousands. And they're very careful about who they work with, right? They don't. Their job is not to care about your company. You, they, once they invest, their job is to care about your company. Right? The very good investors, even if they say no, are very helpful. They give good advice, they'll make some connections, but most of the time, you know, there's a 99% chance you're going to say no. Oh yeah, easily, if not more, depending on the firm. It, it, because if you think about it, they only invest in one out of 100 or one out of 200, so they're going to have to say no to the vast majority of, of companies. Right? But there's a lot of investors out there. And so you have to create a map of investors. Each one requires a custom approach. You gotta be very thoughtful about it. And once you get in there and you do that, then that's kind of how it works. That makes sense? So from their culture? Absolutely. And, 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 and culture is what? Culture is how they get things done. Right? So as much as you can learn about that, the better off you're going to be. So one of our own work is impress them. Yeah. Yeah. One of your goals is to impress them. And the way, the way that you impress them is through clear thinking, right? Be very, very transparent, right? Know who you are. Be very clear about your passions, your strengths. Never ever hide anything and never lie. Because venture capitalists will smell dishonesty like a dog. They will they will they won't know what it is, but they will smell it like a dog and they they hate it. And they will they will they won't tell you, they'll shake your hand, thank you, and they'll never talk to you again. Right? Because when you're when you're on a board, once you do one of these 15 deals, right? You're on a board together for eight years. That is a very intense, very challenging ride with a very small group of people. The honesty factor is so important, right? So you can't pretend to be something that you aren't. You can't hide things that, that you don't have. It, 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 it is. It actually is. It's, it's work to think about. It's like a five-way marriage, right? With no other benefits of marriage. Right? All the hard parts of marriage, none of the benefits. It's a, it's a terrible dynamic. Right? It takes a lot of work. Right? Yeah. So uh, my question is, suppose you are an investor and you, you want to move your investment area from the United States into Indonesia. What are your considerations of barriers, of law issues? Uh, what is the main barrier that differences between the United States business model? And Indonesia. So the question, the question is, how does how does an investment firm that focuses on the United States or expand their focus to Indonesia, and what are the obstacles to to doing that? Uh, you know, it's funny. I don't know about Indonesia because I don't think there's enough of a track record yet. But if you look at countries that are 
you know, that I think Indonesia is going to be similar to, like Brazil or China, where in the last few years venture investing has really picked up. The, the, the legal part of it is not that big a deal because if the legal system works, you work within the legal system. If the legal system doesn't work, like China's legal system is a disaster for Americans, right? So you do everything offshore. Offshore. So you just yeah, just create offshore entities, and you, and you and you 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 manage them from offshore entities to protect yourself. That's not something that people give a lot of thought to. The biggest issue is distance, right? The biggest issue is distance, and how do you how do you measure and manage the portfolio company? So when a big when a firm typically invests in the first in the first investment they make in a faraway country, one of two things happens. You either have a partner who is willing to travel there regularly and to build an ecosystem and a set of relationships. Like an agent? No, it would be actually the partner would actually go there and get to know the <coughs> local investors and, and spend time there. They may be, you know, if it's a firm going to Brazil, it may be a partner who's Latin American. So going to Brazil is not a big deal, and they speak the language. It's one, or they'll take the company out of Brazil or Indonesia and they'll move it to California. Okay. And you can say if you have 50 engineers here, that's fine. We're moving the CEO, the CFO, and the other executives. We're moving them to California, and that's where we're going to operate the company, so that we we can get together in a half an hour if we have to. That's very typical. So you see a huge number of firms from. Company startups from all over Europe, Asia, South Latin America, constantly moving to Silicon Valley, right? And if there's enough, if enough concentration develops, eventually you'll see uh, a company open an office, like several firms have opened offices in China. They're starting to open in Brazil. There's several have offices in Israel. So in those places where there's concentration, that's, that's typically what the obstacle is. Right? It's a very big obstacle. Right? It's going to be. The, I, my guess would be the firms that really begin to be most active in Jakarta and you know Bandung areas are probably going to be based on Singapore. Singapore. Probably. It won't be out of the U.S. for a while. It'll take a little while, but it's going to be. Guarantee you, two to three years from now, four years at the most, Indonesia is going to be a very popular place for Silicon Valley to invest. Okay. So, that's all I've heard. So, it will. It will. What kind of? What's that? What? what so I asked that. Uh, what kind of barriers? You said the distance. Yeah. But what it is, you got to remember that, that the, 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 the mistake that people make about this business is they always try to measure it in rational ways. Right? They always try to apply a system. It's never a system. It's one crazy person. Right? It's going to be one high-profile, talented person from a big firm who's going to be crazy enough to come and do a deal in Indonesia. That's how people in Silicon Valley are going to look at it. Right? In 2001, when we went to China, my board, everyone said, you are crazy. China? There's nothing in China. There's no venture in China. This is crazy. It's a waste of time. We believed it wasn't that crazy. Our risk profile was very low to do it. So we did it. We were right. We did the same thing to Brazil five years ago. Brazil? What do you want to go to the beach? What are you doing? It's like, no, this place is going to be exciting. We went to Turkey last year. That's why we're in Indonesia. It's very predictable. The same thing happens with sectors, right? We brought in a fund in 1999 that did energy. People said, energy? There's no venture in energy. There's no, that's crazy. But it, it isn't. And then it takes one or two crazy people to go do it, and they become very successful. And then everyone else goes, hey, it's like striking oil or finding gold, right? You know, it was that one person in California who found gold, and there was a gold rush. There'll be a gold rush to Indonesia. It's inevitable. There's too much energy. There's too much good stuff you need. Help, right? So it's going to take one person. It will be someone like a Singaporean partner or an Indonesian partner or a Malaysian partner, somebody in the valley who went to Stanford and they have family and connections, and it's not a big deal for them to come back to Jakarta and do a deal, or come back to Bandung. They went to school here, right? They went to graduate school at Stanford. It's not a big deal for them to come back because they know everybody. Right? There's no, if I try to do a deal in Indonesia, I'm going to screw it up because I won't know what questions to ask. I won't know the right people. It's going to be a local who comes back and does it, probably. Right? And that's going to get people's attention. So that would be my prediction. Right? But the legal stuff here, I mean, I don't even know much about the legal system here, but it can't be as bad as China. It's impossible. Right? And India is as bad. Right? And the same thing, you just do stuff offshore. 
If you do stuff in sleep, you can do it right in Swedish system. Right? You may want not want to because the tax tax is kind of ugly in Sweden, but the legal system is very very efficient. So it, that, that's legal is not something people spend a lot of time thinking about. Yes. Um, we have about twenty five minutes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Do I take like one or two more questions real quick? Any other things we want to talk about before we wrap? Uh, yeah. Um, uh,
either one of those is a good thing, right? Your mentor doesn't have to be one or the other, but if they're, if they're able to really understand your business, that's really valuable, right? And their job is, from there, is, is, is to start to lay out, is to listen to you talk about what it is that you want to do, right? And if I hear your ideas, then my job is to suggest maybe patterns of success that I've seen in other places. Here's something I've seen someone else do. Maybe this works. What do you think? Right? Or here's a resource that you need to talk to. Right? But most great mentors in mentoring and mentoring theory will always stop short of telling somebody what they should do. That's just, it's, it's, it, it's, it's not good for anybody. Right? Because if I tell you what to do and it goes wrong, who owns it? I don't want to own it. Right? If I mentor you properly, right, and you make a decision and it goes wrong, right, you own it and you benefit from that. You learn from that. Right? If, if I help mentor you and guide you to you making a decision that's very successful, do you still own it? But I, I, I still get out of it what I wanted to get out of it because all I really care about is your success. I don't care about ownership of your idea because that's not a mentor, that's an investor. Right? And most people mentor because they've been mentored, which is the second test you can run them through. If you're looking for a mentor, have them tell you stories about people who mentored them. It's a very good indicator. People who can talk to their mentors and the impact of their mentors have ideas and frameworks, but they also have a passion. Right? There's a very natural inclination for people who were mentored well to want to mentor. Right? Because they, they, they feel, you know, and a lot of times mentors, all of my, in fact, all of my mentors have said that to me. Well, they'll do something amazing and I'll say, how do I repay you? How do I, how, how do I repay you? And they all say the same thing. I don't need your money. I don't need anything from you. Right? That's why, right, because they're, the reason they're good mentors because they're very successful, right? But they all say the same thing. What you owe me is, when you get that call from somebody, you better take it. And you better put the same effort into it that I did, right? Which is easy to do, but when someone says that to you, 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 you feel that debt, you feel that burden, right? So those are things that you can test for. And then I think that, that when you start to think about the specifics of your business, right, a niche business, one logical assumption is, I, if I'm going to start a restaurant business, I need to talk to a restaurant expert. Maybe, not a bad idea. You're not limited to one mentor, but I'd almost be inclined to talk to a niche business that's totally different from your business because you may discover something about a methodology that makes the restaurant business very innovative. Right? So there's you know things like that. If you think about like a Domino's pizza, right? This is how Domino's pizza was kind of developed. It's a pizza. You know what it is in the U.S.? If you phone and they deliver, it's the first company you could call and they deliver a piece of your door. And probably everybody does it now. But this is like when I was a kid, it's like 40 years ago this existed. I mean, there was even telephones back then. And, but, but the way they came up with the idea was they looked at other businesses that were home delivery businesses and they said, why can't I just apply this to the pizza business? And that's how they come up with so, so I think getting mentors with people, how do you want to solve your customers? Business, I think, is that sort of thing. But I, I think identifying somebody who actually can mentor you well is a really big challenge. And I guarantee you can find somebody who will, a nice person who will try really hard and put energy into it and mentor you badly. That's really easy to do. Those people are around and they don't mean, they don't mean to do it. But it's just they're not trained in it, and it's not an easy thing to do. It's like somebody trying to make you better who's not a trained doctor. Right? You don't want to go to that person. Right? You want to go to a doctor who actually has the, you know, the science to develop. Does that help? Yes. Yeah. Well, good. Another question. Um, any other reference for startups who want to be in Yeah. What about? Say the question. Any other? Well, I think, I think that the advice for niche businesses, the nice thing about a niche business is you can usually bootstrap it. You guys familiar with the phrase bootstrapping? Everyone heard that? You know, 
pull yourself up. You don't have to raise a lot of money. You can usually build it up on your own. You can keep a lot of control over it. Um, the secret to a niche business is gross margins, right? Is how do you come up, if it's a niche business, by definition, it's not going to get big, right? So to make it interesting, you have to have very exciting gross margins, right? So what do you do in your business or your business model that ensures that your gross margin is, remains attractive? So you've constantly got to reinvent the business, right? If you start with a business and you say, hey, this is pretty clever, and have nice gross <coughs> margins, if you have gross margins, you're going to get competition. You get competition, your prices are going to come down, and your margins are going to shrink. So you're constantly reinventing the business. What we see today is people pay for three things in niche businesses that are very, very, very valuable. It's very interesting. One is design, right? So the more you can do to invest in the design of your business, the better. And some of the ways you can do that at very low cost is there's a lot of design competitions on the internet. So if you have to come up with a logo or an idea, you can put it out there. You get 100 people offering you world-class designs. It might cost you like 100 US, where if you hired a consultant, it would cost you $10,000, right? Which you can't do in a niche business, right? So think very hard about designing the experience, designing people will pay. I mean, think about Apple, right? Gross margins on an Apple, a lot of that is design-based. The functionality of a lot of Apple products are not as good. They're the same or not as good as a lot of other products that are much cheaper. But people pay. They pay to have that Apple thing on the back of their computer, right? And, it's, and that's why their margin, part of the reason their margins are crazy. A second area is curation. If you guys are familiar with the word curation or curate, right? Is part of your business and each business is, it, and it goes hand in hand with the third, which is education. People want information. They want compelling information, right? So if you're going to be in a niche business, know your business better than anybody else. Build a community with your customers by constantly curating and educating, right? So if you if you happen to be in the restaurant business, make curate information. So you'll see some restaurants will, when they serve you food, they'll have stories about the farm where they grew the organic vegetables. Right? And it may seem kind of stupid. You know, at first you're like, who cares? But you know what? I care. A lot of people care. And you know what? That's cool that I know exactly. I, and you know what? If I get to know the restaurateur, I can go see the farm. I can take my kids and show them how they farm organically. Well, guess what? I don't care how much that restaurant costs. Because I'm now a part of that community, and it's made my life more interesting. So whatever it is, we curate and educate constantly. So push that design. And that allows you to stay a specialist in an area that you may really love. But those are some ideas that you can that you can use. Those are sort of some of the trends that are coming out. Very high margin drivers. Design, curation, education. That's where a lot of focus is investing right now. Does that help? C U R A T I O N. You're going to see that word. Curation is going to be like innovation in the next decade. You're going to see curation, you're going to see it everywhere. And it's just going to become a buzzword. So, You're going to see design, curation, education. Right. And what I think is interesting about this, if you go back to that scenario of, of you know, when you, you get into transition, right, with low, you know, low uh, transparency, high change, right, all three of these things. When you do this right, it pushes you up into higher levels of transparency and higher levels of comfort. This is why people will pay for this, because it, it, it decreases confusion and it decreases stress. So you're going to see this is where a lot of investment trends in Silicon Valley is going. Right? It's, moving, it's moved away from hardware a long time ago. It's now moving away from software. Facebook is, has software, a nice, very nice technology software play. But you don't. No one buys it. It's free. So why do they make so much money? Those three things, right? You see a lot more of that. This is what social media is really about. So that would be my advice. Good. 
So should we, uh, you guys have been here a long time, so maybe we should call it a day. Uh, but I can hang around, I don't think we, we have to go somewhere a little bit, but if you guys have any questions, I think I can hang around. So thank you very much for all the time.